Well, this morning, we're going where angels fear to tread. Let's turn in our Bibles to the Song of Solomon. <laughs> we're going to talk about sex. And men, men, I'm expecting you to take notes during this session. <laughs> you, you may have never taken a note a day in your life. You may have gone through school and never took a note. But you want to take notes over these next few minutes. So ladies, give him the pen, give him a piece of paper, and make him take notes. This is, there you go. Give it to, give it to the boy. There you go. Great. <laughs> Let him take notes. Guys, you need to take notes uh, over this Bible study. And uh, everybody needs to kind of squeeze a little bit tight, sit a little bit tighter to, to their spouse, at least to where you can reach over and grab their knee. This is going to be a knee-squeezing Bible study. You don't even have to look. You can just reach over and just squeeze their knee. They'll know what you mean. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, this wonderful morning. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts and all that you're going to continue to do uh, in our hearts and in our marriages this morning. Lord, uh, we approach a subject that we don't talk much about in church, but Lord, it's so important uh, to you and it's important to us, and I pray that you would give us uh, needed instruction today. We love you and thank you for your spirit who is our teacher. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once a pig farmer had three sows that he wanted to breed with his neighbor's boar. One morning after calling to make arrangements, he loaded the three pigs in the back of his pickup truck and he drove to his friend's farm. There he unloaded his sows, he put them in the pen with the male pig and he left them there for the rest of the day. Well, when he returned that afternoon, he asked his neighbor how he would know if the mating had been successful. Well, his friend told him, he says, in the morning when you wake up, if the pigs are rolling in the grass, you know it took. If they're rolling in the mud, you know it didn't. Well, the next morning, the farmer ran to the window, he checked on his sows, and there they were, all three girls were out there rolling in the mud. Well, the farmer was disappointed, but he decided to try it again. And so he loaded up the pigs in the back of his pickup. He took them back to his friend's farm. Again, he put them in the pen with the board. He promised to return that afternoon. When he arrived, he asked again. He said, now, how do I know little piglets are on the way? Well, the neighbor repeated. He says, if they're rolling in the grass, you know it took. If they're rolling in the mud, you know it didn't. Well, as soon as he awoke the next day, he looked out the window, and there the pigs were rolling in the mud, undaunted, he loaded up the three sows a third time, and he returned to his neighbor. Well, at the end of the day, he asked his friend one more time. He says, now let me make sure I get this straight. If they're rolling in the grass, it took. If they're rolling in the mud, it didn't. That's right, you got it. Well, that night, the farmer had to fly out of town. But the next morning, he called his wife, and he asked her to look out the window and tell him, are the pigs rolling in the grass, or are they rolling in the mud? Well, he weighed it. And he waited. Well, finally, his wife returned to the phone. He had to know. He said, honey, please tell me, are the pigs rolling in the grass or are they rolling in the mud? She responded, neither. Two of them are in the back of your pickup truck and one is in the cab honking the horn. <laughs> Obviously, his neighbor's male pig was no boar. The moral of the story is that God created sex not just for breeding, but for blessing. The Creator designed sex not just for our procreation, but for our pleasure. If all God cared about was repopulating the earth, cloning or cell division would have done the job. But sex brings a husband and a wife together in a manner that creates intimacy and enjoyment. Sex fuses two lives and solidifies the commitment and closeness between a husband and wife. Make no mistake about it, when God created sex, like everything else he created, he said that it was good. 
Today, we want to look at the biblical account of Solomon and the Shulamite. For the Song of Solomon describes just how lavish a source of intimacy and ecstasy sex can be between a husband and a wife. You know, since sex is so often abused and misused in our society, we get the impression that sex is evil, but not so. That is certainly not God's take on the subject. Hebrews 13 verse 4 reads, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. The word translated bed there is the Greek word for sexual intercourse. Proverbs 5 verses 18 and 19 daringly declares, Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Always be enraptured with her love. Hey, God is no prude. God's version of sex as it should be is so graphic, the language in this book so erotic and sensual that the Jewish rabbis prohibited their young men from even reading the Song of Solomon until they had reached the age of 30 years old. These eight chapters will steam your glasses. They'll cause your pulse to race. They'll cause your face to blush. But just remember, God isn't blushing. God wrote the book on sex, and he wants us to read it and understand it and even model it in our marriages. You know, a trip to the bookstore will turn up thousands of sex manuals on the market, but there's only one written by the Creator, and that's the Song of Solomon. This morning, we're going to chart the sexual highs and lows of Solomon and the Shulamite. For marriage, and especially sex in marriage, is not always fireworks and red-hot Fourth of July's. There are occasionally chilly days where the temperature dips near freezing. At times the sex sizzles, at other times it can fizzle, but most of the time it's somewhere in between. This was the experience of Shlomo and Shula. If you're taking notes, and you men should be, I've outlined their ups and downs as follows. That's what I want you to write down, guys. You ready? The bill for sex, write that down the bill for sex, the thrill of sex, the frills to sex, the skill in sex, and finally the chill on sex. Here it is again in shorthand form, five movements in this book, the bill, the thrill, the frills, the skill, and the chill. Now, before we pry into their sex life, let me introduce to you our couple. Well, Solomon, you probably know. He was the king of Israel. One day, his royal entourage was weaving its way through the countryside when he saw this beautiful maiden keeping watch over her family's flocks. Solomon returned to meet her disguised as a shepherd. And it was only after she had fallen in love with him and agreed to marry him that he revealed to her his true identity. Now, this Shulamite was a country girl, sort of a hillbilly babe, sort of like a Carrie Underwood. (laughs) Beautiful, but a little backwoods. And this was why Solomon fell in love with her. His palace was packed with cover girls, pampered pinups with store-bought beauty. But the Shulamite was different. Hers was a natural beauty, a simple, rustic, yet stunning beauty. She had the perfections of a rose, the attractiveness of a field of wild dandelions. And she was honest, a woman of virtue and character, undefiled by the big city. Her country charm and innocence had caused the king to fall in love, and he took her to be his wife and moved her to his palace. Well, chapter 1 opens with her already in Jerusalem. She is a new queen in new surroundings. During her country courtship, it was just her and her shepherd, just the two of them, Shlomo and Shula. The days were free, the hours were private, the duties were light, but now she is the wife of the king. She has servants and responsibilities. And Solomon, too, is about his daily duties. He's busy attending to affairs of state, and he's often late returning to the palace. Life has changed for them both. She's not used to sharing her husband with so many people. And she is now painfully aware that in the palace there are other women who long for her husband. She sees the looks. Oh, they would love to be with the king. 
Upon moving to the city, she realizes she now has competition. And this is why in chapter 1, we find her questioning her attractiveness, nursing her insecurities. Listen to her sulk in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. She says, I am dark, but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. The Shulamite bemoans the fact that her skin is tough and tanned. She feels inferior. These palace princesses were always indoors. They were pampered with bubble baths and facials. Their skin was moisturized. They had creamy complexions. But the Shulamite had been out in the fields under the hot sun, caring more about her brother's sheep than about her own appearance. And when she compares herself with the royal court, she feels inferior. And she wonders why Solomon would ever love the likes of her. Men, the first step toward a healthy sex life for you and your wife. You ready? Got that pen? You ready? The first step is for you to show a sensitivity to your wife's insecurity. A sensitivity to your wife's insecurities. The bill, if you will, the cost for a bright, vibrant, vigorous sexual intimacy is your sensitivity. For fellows, just like the Shulamite maiden, your wife has some misgivings about her physical appearance. You know, a recent Harris poll revealed that 99% of all women, that's a lot of women, 99%. 99% of all women wish they could change something about their body. The popularity of breast implants and fanny tucks and facelifts testify to female insecurities. Men, your wife won't give herself freely and uninhibitedly unless she is certain you're satisfied with what you're getting. This is why you are a blabbering idiot if you are ever critical or condemning of your wife's appearance. Did, did I say that with enough tenderness? <laughs> a blabbering idiot. If you want her to want you, then praise how she looks. Tell her how much you love the special features God created in her, even the features she's added over the years. <laughs> the more assurance you bring... The more affirmation you send her, the more trust that she has in your acceptance and your appreciation, the more she'll be able to open up and loosen up in her sexual expression. And this is what Solomon does. Look at how he speaks to her concerns in verse 8. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents, for I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. Solomon praises the Shulamite's beauty. He assures her that as far as he's concerned, she has no competition. The mention here of Pharaoh's filly was probably a reference to the daughter of Pharaoh who was given to Solomon in a diplomatic maneuver to ratify the peace treaty he had signed with Egypt. The presence of this princess had added to the Shulamites' insecurities. Solomon lets his wife know that she is the only girl for him. Radical feminist Gloria Steinem was once asked why she had never married. Gloria responded, I could never mate in captivity. Well, if Gloria wants to compare herself to a wild animal, that's up to her. But most of the women I talk to, they view marriage not as a captivity, but as an opportunity for creativity. For only when a woman is completely sure of her husband's acceptance and commitment can she release mentally and relax emotionally and explode sexually. Husbands, always remember, the bill for a healthy sex life is your sensitivity to your wife's insecurities. Well, second, notice the Shulamite describes the thrill of sex. She recalls one night in particular that characterized the early days of their marriage. The evening began with an official dinner and ended with a sexual feast. 
The king and queen were at a royal function when the Shulamite tells us what happened. Chapter 1, verse 12. While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. That evening, the Shulamite had gone to dinner wearing a new perfume. It could have been Hillel number five. <laughs> well, in the midst of the meal, the king caught the aroma. The aroma wafts across the room, and it was recognized by the king. He knew it was her perfume. The couple exchanged knowing glances, and just the look in each other's eyes aroused passions. We're allowed to eavesdrop in on the conversation once the dinner was over and they had returned home. They're in the palace bedroom when in verse 15, Solomon says to his bride, Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. The Shulamite answers him in verse 16. Behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. The beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. And notice here, she's talking about the rafters, which means she must have been lying on her back. The Shulamite is inviting her husband to bed. In chapter 2, verse 1, she says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. And this is again a sign of her insecurities. For in ancient Israel, roses and lilies were common flowers. Rather than go for $100 a dozen, you could pick up roses anywhere. And here the Shulamite is bringing her insecurities to bed. Self-doubt will spoil the evening unless a quick-thinking Solomon picks up the bill. And look at how he answers her. Verse 2. Oh, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. What a fantastic line. She calls herself a lily, but Solomon counters by saying, Oh no, a lily among thorns. Solomon was sensitive to his wife's reservations and insecurities and quick to lay them to rest. She continues, Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. The phrase translated lovesick means that she was exhausted from making love. And the talk here of raisin cakes and apples, it has sexual overtones. After a night of stimulating sex, in verse 7, the Shulamite has some advice for her single servants. She says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. As a nuclear reaction has to be contained, lest it causes damage, sex is also an emotional reaction that should be reserved only for marriage. Now, there are two points here that I'd like to make about this episode. The wooing and the wording. Guys, write that down. The wooing and the wording both add to the thrill of sex. First, I want you to notice the wooing. Shlomo and Shula begin their foreplay long before they enter the bedroom. It all starts at this dinner, this official function that they had. You know, a book was published several years ago entitled Sex Begins in the Kitchen. I never read the book, but I've never forgotten the title. The implication is that little thoughts of kindness and thoughtfulness and tenderness throughout the day do more to arouse your wife sexually than does a sudden embrace at the end of the day. See, good husbands realize the differences in the sexual impulses of men and women. Men are turned on by sight. Show the old boy a little leg and he goes wild. But women are aroused slowly, more gradually. A stimulating night in bed begins with a kind word at breakfast or a telephone call during the day just to check on how she's doing or help with the dishes or help with the kids getting their homework done and putting them to bed. 
Women respond more to forethought than to simply foreplay. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I knew it was coming. When it comes to sexual desire, men are like dry leaves. Easily combustible. It doesn't take much for them to ignite, but they burn out rather quickly. Whereas women are like charcoal. Oh, it takes longer and more effort to ignite them. Lighting charcoal can be a very delicate job. You have to protect it with, from the wind. And you have to prime it with a little lighter fluid. You have to be patient. It may take several matches before you can get that fire started, before you get a flame. But once it begins to burn, man, it lasts a lot longer than a pile of leaves. <laughs> Men, your wife has a deeper threshold for sexual enjoyment than you do. But if she's to experience it, she needs to be gently primed and protected and shown patience. Notice the wooing, but second, notice the wording. Why all this symbolism? All this talk of apples and raisin cakes? Realize when God speaks of sexual expression, he doesn't use slang terms, which would be crass and crude. Nor does he use medical terms which would sound unromantic and mechanical. No, God uses poetic symbolism to describe sexual expression. The Shulamite says, I sat down in his shade. His fruit was sweet to my taste. Boy, when you think of it symbolically, these phrases are quite the turn on. Ladies, what sounds more appealing to you? Hey, get over here and let me inspect the merchandise. (laughs) Or, let me visit your garden and enjoy its fruits. (laughs) Now, I'm not going to give you any examples, but Kathy and I have had a lot of fun experimenting with our own phrases. I'm just saying a great way for a couple to spice up their sex life is with verbal stimulation. Don't talk dirty, but talk descriptive. Develop some clean, poetic, yet suggestive language to stimulate your spouse and communicate what you desire. It's biblical, and it will dramatically enhance your sexual expression. Well, next, I want you to notice the frills to sex. For in chapters 2 through 5, the Shulamite flashes back to their courtship to Solomon's proposal, and to the honeymoon. It was a spring day when he proposed. She accepted, of course, and Solomon went to Jerusalem to prepare for the nuptials. He then returned for the wedding, and they honeymooned all the way from Lebanon back down to the city of Jerusalem. And she remembers it well. Chapter 3, verse 6, she says, Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders. Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. Now, of these frills, I want you to notice, and guys, you're writing this down, frills, under that, I want you to notice two things. The couch and the clothes. The couch and the clothes. Solomon comes riding in his honeymoon limo. This palanquin was a mobile bedroom. It was sort of the ancient version of a customized van. (laughs) With the stereo and the opaque glass and the shag carpet, you know. This is the vehicle that you would never allow your teenage daughter to step foot in. The court ladies in Jerusalem lined the bed with soft flower petals and scented powders. 
You see, the Orientals believe that the art of lovemaking should include the stimulation of all five senses. The honeymoon environment was exciting and stimulating and soothing. Listen, guys, Solomon's couch showed that he cared. Husbands, please understand that when it comes to your wife's sexual desire, environment matters. When a man is aroused, all that exists in the world are those two sheets and his wife. For the guy, sex is a time to block out. But for the wife, sex is a time to take in. Thus, she becomes acutely aware of her surroundings. Are the clothes picked up? Can the children hear us? Are the lights just right? Are the dishes done? Dishes done? A husband could care less about the dishes being done. I'd just as soon go downstairs and throw the dishes out in the backyard and buy y'all new dishes. Oh, but a smart lover doesn't fight with his wife on these issues. He plays by her rules and he makes the environment they share as enticing as possible. One biblical commentator describes the bedroom environment that we'd find if we had climbed into the king's palanquin. The wall would be lined with beautiful linen and satin curtains coated with scented powders to make the room smell erotic. The bed sheets were dusted with scented powders as was the clothing. Furthermore, their bodies were anointed with scented lotions. To top it all off, they probably burned incense and thus the whole room was filled with smoke. In fact, we probably would have choked. (laughs) Guys, Perhaps you could start with a little scaled-down version. Men, draw a warm bubble bath for your wife. And let her soak while you do the dishes and put the kids to bed. Prep the bedroom with some soft lights, some romantic music. Go down to Walmart. Pick you up one of those love songs from the 80s. Put that CD on. Buy you one of those scented candles, you know, vanilla flavor or whatever. Give your girl a massage with some soothing lotion. Try that once a week for three months and tell me if you're disappointed with the results. See, Solomon shows his wisdom here by sparing no expense in creating the right atmosphere for his bride. Look, too, at the Shulamite's clothes. For in chapter 4, verse 1, we're told that she's wearing a veil. In other words, sexy lingerie. An old pastor friend said to a young Charlie Shedd, he said, Son, you've got to save money somewhere, but there are two places you should never cut back. Never try to save money on food or your wife's lingerie. A woman will act sexy if she feels sexy, and she'll feel sexy if she looks sexy. So I say, sell the car. Who needs to? (laughs) Refinance the house. Put off buying shoes for the kids. But whatever you do, don't you dare cut back on your wife's lingerie budget. My wife knows that she can take that credit card at any time. She has an unlimited lingerie budget. Well, fourth here, I want you to notice the skill in sex. Listen carefully as we read through chapter 4. And again, husbands, take notes. Because I'm afraid that some of us guys are like all hands. We've yet to learn that touching our wife with words does far more to arouse her than just us pawing all over. And this Solomon man, he is a master at spinning a phrase. He arouses his wife by whispering compliments in her ears. Guys, write this down. His talk, his tenderness, and then his touch work together to bring the Shulamite to sexual satisfaction. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Imagine watching a flock of black goats walking down a mountain in single file line. And you get the idea here. He's describing the locks of her hair. 
Of course, hair like goat's hair might not mean as much to your wife as it did to Solomon's. You might have to do a little translation work here, but work at it. She'll love it. Verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep, which have come up from the washing, every one of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. Apparently, she had a good orthodontist as a kid. Verses 3 and 4, your lips are like a strand of scarlet, and your mouth is lovely. And realize, you don't come up with this kind of imagery on the spur of the moment. Solomon has given this wording some advanced thought and some preparation. He continues, he says, Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built for an armory, on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Solomon loves her jewelry. I mean, baby, your necklace is like an ammunition belt. (laughs) Typical man. And apparently, he's working his way down. Down her body, from her temples to her neck. Oh, down he goes. In verses 5 and 6, he whispers, Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. And I'll just let you guess what he means by mountain of myrrh and hill of frankincense. But men, make no mistake about it. You are watching a skilled lover here at work. He doesn't just jump right in and go for the big splash. He moves slowly and gently, lovingly lingering over every inch of her body. He shows some self-restraint. He takes time to tell her how beautiful she is to him. Shlomo knows what he's doing. In verse 8, he says, Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Remember, it had only been a few days since they were in faraway Lebanon. And he sits here, her mind wandering. And so what does he do? He addresses her concerns. This is a revolutionary idea for some of you guys. But sometimes, before a wife is ready for sex, she might want to talk. Did you ever think about that, guys? She might want to discuss her day or what's happening with the kids. The wise husband resists the urge to just get on with it. Instead, he remains sensitive to her needs. Solomon says in verse 9, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love and the scent of your perfumes and all spices. Your lips, O my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. The Hebrews knew about this kissing long before the French took credit for it. (laughs) And then in verse 12, he turns up the heat. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchid of pomegranates with pleasant fruits. Fragrant henna with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon. With all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. You need to understand that gardens in biblical times were more than a couple of rows of vegetables. They were walled enclosures, interlaced with paths and fountains and shade and fruit trees. There were sweet-smelling herbs, and there were little breezy arbors where you could sit and enjoy the refreshing effects of the garden. See, up until the honeymoon, the Shulamite sexuality was a garden enclosed. The wall was up. The marriage, before the marriage, this garden full of spices and sweets was owned by her alone. But now she invites, even entices her husband to enter her garden and enjoy its pleasures. Notice here, he initiates, and she doesn't just tolerate. No, she invites him to her garden. Verse 16, she says, 
Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. The Shulamite asked Solomon to arouse her passions and enjoy its fruits. Notice both husband and wife here are givers, not just takers. There should be no selfishness in the marriage bed. The goal should be to please each other, not just ourselves. And I love the last half of chapter 5, verse 1. Many Bible commentators believe it's actually the voice of God putting his stamp of approval on their sexual expression. He says, eat, O friends. Drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. Remember from the very beginning, God said that it was good. Well, finally, I want you to notice the chill on sex. For in chapter 5, the Shulamite has a dream that warns her about some bad attitudes that are creeping into her sex life. She says in verse 2, I sleep, but my heart is awake. In other words, this is a dream. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. In her dream, Solomon is late getting home from work. Must have been the wee hours of the morning because his clothes are soaked with the dew. He wants into the queen's room to initiate intimacy, but she's not willing. In verse 3, she offers up a couple of lame excuses. She says, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? And I know what Solomon's thinking. Baby, don't worry about your robe. That's the last thing you're going to need with what I got in mind. And then she says, I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? I mean, all of a sudden, the old gal develops a clean foot fetish. What a lame excuse. She just doesn't want to be bothered, does she? That's right. She recalls in verse 4, My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. And my heart yearned for him. I rose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. See, by the time the Shulamite rises to open the door, Solomon is gone. He has been spurned. His fragile male ego, and ladies, it's a lot more fragile than you think. His fragile male ego has been crushed. She realizes that he's been hurt, and she races out into the street to find him and to apologize. I am convinced that most women don't realize how significant sex is to their husband. Clueless might be too strong a word. But they vastly underestimate its significance. Let me ask you ladies a question. How many wives desire conversation with their husbands? Raise your hand. How many wives desire conversation with your husbands? Great, just about all of you. How many of you would think that something was terribly wrong in your relationship if conversation were lacking? Raise your hand. Yep, yep. Well, wives, recognize a simple truth. Sex is to a husband what conversation is to a wife. Ladies, when the world beats your man down and his superiors mistreat him, when he falls short of his goals, sex is your tool to prop back up his confidence. A wife can let her husband know that at least to one person, he is still the most desirable man in the world. A sensitive woman can use her sensual charms to pump air back into a man's deflated sails. Through sex, she can make everything right in his world, at least for a night. She can encourage him in his manhood. And ladies, even when you have to turn your husband down, and at times you will, please do it gently. Another writer writes, When a wife needs to reject her husband's sexual advances, he may feel down, not just for missing out on a moment of pleasure, but his manhood may feel rejected. 
See, this is why a wise woman eases the blow by saying something. Well, I just can't get with it tonight, baby, but I know I won't be able to stay away from a man like you for long. <laughs> when Kathy says that to me, it's like, oh, okay. I can wait another night, no problem. And ladies, make sure those rejections are few and far between. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says to married couples that our bodies are not our own. You know, when I got married, me and my wife made a swap. She got my hairy, ugly, naughty, dirty body. And I got her beautiful, curvaceous, sweet, soft body. I think I got a pretty good deal. (laughs) Verse 4 puts it. In 1 Corinthians 7, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Her body's mine and my body's hers. And therefore, he says in verse 5, do not deprive one another. And the reason for that, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. In short, sex in marriage should consist of three F's. Make it fun make it fulfilling, and perhaps most importantly, make it frequent. See, the Shulamite here makes three changes in her marriage to remove the chill that had settled over their sex life. Write these down, guys. First was a new attitude toward her husband. Second was a new aggressiveness toward her husband. And third, she sought out a new atmosphere to share with her husband. And we'll close with these three changes. First, notice she adopts a new attitude toward her husband's body. Listen to her in chapter 5, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. Now, so far in the relationship, only Solomon has described his spouse's physical features. But now the Shulamite describes Solomon's body. Notice She is training her mind to think sexually about her husband. And she too starts with his hair and works his way down. In fact, the ivory portion of his body is the area where the sun never shines. It stays white. And the sapphire inlays are the blood vessels running under his skin. She says in verse 15, His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. In other words, he's strong and tall. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. To some women, the word husband has become a synonym for provider, father, nice guy, even friend but they have stopped associating the term with the word lover. Wives, you need to view your husband's body as God's gift to satisfy you sexually. Not the romance novel, but your husband's body. There is nothing wrong with you thinking of your husband in erotic, sensual, sexual ways. Here the Shulamite is daydreaming about Solomon's physical features, and it's breaking the chill. Her new attitude toward her husband's body is arousing her sexual passion. Well, second, notice a new sexual aggressiveness toward her husband. In chapter 7, she dances for Solomon. And understand, this is definitely not the foxtrot. This is no square dance. Ladies, this is a very sensual, sexy, seductive dance done only for the purpose of arousing her husband sexually, and it is only for the bedroom. In verse 1, Solomon talks about his wife's sandals, but that's the last stitch of clothing he mentions. Apparently, that's all she had on was a pair of sandals. 
in verse 1. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your thighs are like the jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. Now this phrase, the curve of your thighs, is best translated, the vibration of your hips. The Shulamite understands that men are turned on visually. And so she's providing her husband with some visual sexual stimulation. Now, when you get to your bedroom later tonight, I want you to read the rest of chapter 7. This must have been quite a dance. But ladies, don't miss the point. There are times in marriage when you need to be the sexual aggressor. If your husband is the only one in the marriage initiating intimacy, he grows frustrated and he gets the impression that he's a burden on his wife. Husbands need to know that sexual desire in the marriage is a two-way street. Female author Joe Barry writes this, One of the greatest blessings a husband receives is when his wife takes the initiative. Those are the times he cherishes in his heart. Just as a woman cherishes an unexpected gift or a bouquet of flowers, a couple's sex life will be very one-sided and vital lines of communication blocked if the husband always has to be the one to institute sex. The Shulamite understood this and she worked through whatever reservation she had to bless her husband. Many wives are afraid that if they show too much sexual interest toward their husband, he'll become more obsessed with sex than he already is. But that is seldom true. Question. When are you most obsessed with food? Answer. When you're on a diet. But your obsession with food dissipates when you can eat all you want. And wife, you'll find the same is true with your husband's sexual appetites. Take the old boy off the diet and he might just settle into a frequency that's comfortable for you both. Well, finally, I want you to notice the new atmosphere. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether the grape blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. See, the Shulamite realizes that a change of scenery might renew her sexual interest. And so she suggests a romantic trip. Let's go to the country. Perhaps your marriage could benefit from the same, a cruise or a mountain getaway. In conclusion, let me summarize what we've learned. Guys, ready? Get your notes out. You ready? See how you did. The bill for a vibrant sex life is a... Come on. Help me, guys. The bill to a vibrant sex life is a... Exactly. The thrill is accentuated by wooing and wording. Don't forget the frills. The couch and the... Unlimited sex lingerie budget. The skill involves talk, tenderness, then touch, and the chill is broken with a change of attitude and aggressiveness and atmosphere. For as with all of life, sex included, things go better with God. If you want the best sex life, do it God's way. Follow the Bible, the owner's manual, and before long, your spouse will be in the pickup honking the horn. (laughs) Father, we thank you. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen.